welcome back to another episode of Finance Uncut. On today's episode, we're going to discuss the core of Austrian economic theory. So here we'll have a look at this article by Lou Rockwell discussing the core of Austrian theory. The concepts of scarcity and choice lie at the heart of Austrian economics. Man is constantly faced with a wide array of choices. Every action implies foregone alternatives or costs, and every action by definition designed to improve the actor's lot from his point of view. Moreover, every actor in the economy has a different set of values and preferences, different needs and desires, and different time schedules for the goals he needs to reach. The needs, tastes, desires, and time schedules of different people cannot be added or subtracted from other people's. It is not possible to collapse tastes or time schedules into uh, one curve and call it consumer preference. Why? Because economic value is subjective to the individual. Similarly, it is not possible to collapse the complexity of market arrangements into enormous aggregates. We cannot, for example, say the economy's capital stock is one big blob summarized by the letter K, put that into an equation and expect it to yield useful information. The capital stock is heterogeneous, simply meaning it's made up of different things, different parts, different, you know, whatever. Some capital may be intended to create goods for sale tomorrow and others for sale in 10 years. The time schedules for capital use are as varied as the capital stock itself. Austrian theory sees competition as a process of discovering new and better ways to organize resources. One that is fraught with errors, but that is constantly being improved. This way of looking at the market is markedly different from every other school of thought. Since Keynes, Economists have developed the habit of constructing parallel universes having nothing to do with the real world. In these universes, capital is homogenous and competition is a static end state. There are the right number of sellers, prices reflect the cost of production, there are no excess profits. Economic welfare is determined by adding up the utilities of all individuals in society. Passing of time is rarely accounted for except in changing from one static state to another. Varying time schedules of producers and consumers are simply non-existent. Instead, we have aggregates that give us precious little information at all. A conventional economist is quick to agree with these model that these models are unrealistic. Ideal types can be used as mere tools of analysis, but this is disingenuous. And see, same economists use these models for policy recommendations. One obvious example of basing policy on contrived models of the economy takes place at the Justice Department's Antitrust Division. There, the bureaucrats pretend to know the proper structure of industry. What kind of mergers and acquisitions harm the economy? Who has too much market share or who has too little? And what the relevant market is? This represents what Hayek called the pretense of knowledge. The correct relationship between competitors can only be worked out through buying and selling, not bureaucratic fiat. Austrian economists, in particular Murray Rothbard, argue that the only real monopolies are created by government. Markets are too competitive to allow any monopolies to be sustained. Another example is the idea that economic growth can be manufactured by manipulating aggregate demand curves through more and faster government spending, considered to be a demand booster instead of a supply reducer or government bullying of the consuming public. If the hallmark of conventional economics is unrealistic models, the hallmark of Austrian economics is a profound appreciation of the price system. Prices provide economic actors with critical information about the relative scarcity of goods and services. It is not necessary for consumers to know, for example, that a disease has swept the chicken population to know that they should economize on eggs. The price system by making eggs more expensive, informs the public of the appropriate behaviour. The price system tells producers when to enter and leave markets by relaying information about consumer preferences. And it tells producers the most efficient, that is, the least costly way to assemble other resources to create goods. Apart from the price system, there is no way to know these things. But prices must be generated by the free market. They cannot be made up 
the way the government printing office makes up the prices for its publications. It cannot be based on the costs of production in the manner of the post office. Those practices create distortions and inefficiency. Rather, prices must grow out of the free actions of individuals in a jur juridical, juridical setting that respects private property. I hate that word. Neoclassical price theory, as found in most graduate texts, covers much of this territory. But typically, it takes for granted the accuracy of prices apart from their foundation in private property. As a result, virtually every plan for reforming the post-socialist economies talked about the need for better management. Loans from the West, new and different forms of regulation, the removal of price controls, but not private property. The result was the economic equivalent of a train wreck. Free floating prices simply cannot do their work apart from private property and concomitant freedom to contract. I hate the word as well. Austrian theory sees private property as the first principle of sound. Economists in general neglect this subject, and when they mention it, it is to find a philosophical basis for its violation. The logic and legitimacy of market failure analysis and its public goods rollery is widely accepted by non-Austrian schools of thought. The notion of public goods is that they cannot be supplied by the market. Instead, must be supplied by government and funded through its taxing power. The classic case is the lighthouse, except that, as Ronald Coase has shown, private lighthouses existed for centuries. Some definitions of public goods can be so broad that if you throw out common sense, everyday consumer goods qualify. Out that it is impossible to know whether or not the market is failing without an independent test of which there is none outside the actions of individuals. The market itself is the only available criterion for determining how resources ought to uh, I would also throw in uh, that Austrians, um, uh, once again, being uh, you know, uh, a free market, sound money uh, is a is kind of the platform or the base or the, or the slab or the foundations of a good economy. When we have fiat uh, or, or fractional reserve uh, type banking or currency, uh, then that can be manipulated and that can um, change, uh, manipulate interest rates, which manipulates different markets. Uh, we then get inflation, which uh, makes savers worse off. Um, so w one of the other things that Austrians differ from most other uh, schools of economics is also sound money which is basically gold and silver. Some economists like uh, Hayat talked about having a uh, just a free market on money. So if, if I wanted to create my own currency and go out there in the marketplace, I can do so. Uh, but ultimately uh, that good money or, or the one that the majority of people trust and go for will be the winner in the end. Uh, but ultimately it's sound money. That is something that Austrians uh, believe in and, and push and promote. and. Basically, the data and facts uh, are on our side. Uh, also, the business cycle theory uh, is, is something that uh, von Mises talked about in particular. And, and this is one of the reasons why Austrians have got such a great record at being able to predict booms and busts before they happen. Everyone can see them after they've happened and analyze them and say, well, this and this and this caused it or whatever. Austrians have got a wonderful track record of over 100 years from, from what I can see uh, of predicting booms and busts based on you know, the business cycle and, and you know, how, how central banks, governments, uh, things uh, bring forward demand. Because we really see things from a different perspective than people. You know, the economy is made up of individuals. Uh, it's it's not simply you know pull pull a lever and the whole economy turns left. Uh, press this button and everybody in the economy will do the exact same thing. Uh, we've got 
different needs, goals, and desires in different time frames. We value things differently. Uh, you know, so you cannot just put it into a, a model and press a button or pull a lever and think that this is going to happen and that's going. You know, um, you know central banks have been wanting uh, super high CPI uh, inflation uh, price increases uh, by doing QE and doing uh, lowering interest rates. Oh, and they haven't quite got it. Uh, but what they don't want to do is let that genie out of the bag. I think they're about to. It's very hard to get that genie back into the bag, into the bottle, whatever, whatever you've got. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, a bit about Austrian theory uh, compared to other, uh, other economic theories. If you want to learn more, I definitely, probably the best book, the, the most simple economic book out there is uh, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Uh, that would be my first book that I would recommend anybody reading if they want uh, just anything about economics, just a basic understanding of economics, let alone Austrian economics. Uh, so, and it's a very easy read. So that's um, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Uh, and then obviously, probably you know, the most famous book um, for, for Austrian economists is Ludwig von Mises' Schumann Action. It's a large book, nearly a thousand pages long, uh, very, very large, but that's his, his thing. I personally uh, prefer Murray Rothbard. I've read a lot of Murray Rothbard books and uh, I, he's probably my favorite Austrian um, who, I, uh, who I like to follow. He, he writes, uh, very well, very easy to understand. Human action is is a very um, deep book, um, but Murray Rothbard, I think, uh, that would be my preference. So if you if you want to read more about Austrian economics, I'd definitely recommend Murray Rothbard. Mark Thornton and others are, are good as well. Joseph Salerno, um, there, there's really a ton of Austrians out there. But Lou Rockwell himself is is good to follow and to and to read up on. But yeah, so there's a bit of a rundown of what Austrian theory is all about, the core of Austrian theory, and uh, so hopefully you understand a little bit more uh, why I subscribe to this theory of economics. Uh, why I think all other theories are, are a bit on the dodge. Um, yeah, I used to be a bit of a classical type guy, uh, Adam Smith type guy, until I came across, across uh, uh, Austrian, and then I came across uh, Richard Cantillon uh, and his book. Now, the name of it escapes me right now, but I'm sure you can Google it. Um, where and he wrote it. Uh, his he was born and lived before Adam Smith and wrote his book before Adam Smith. And um, when you read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, uh, uh, I don't want to be mean to Adam Smith, but there's a lot of plagiarism there. Adam Smith didn't give him the credit uh, for that. It's almost word for word copied there. And, uh, and once again, the... Labor theory of value that Adam Smith uh, really pushed out there, really uh, it wound uh, Karl Marx up, and that's what really drove Karl Marx to then come out and write his things and start, you know, because that for him was, you know, well, hey, if, if everything's based on labor, the value is based on labor, that's how we price things, and that means, you know, workers are being just you know, treated like slaves, blah 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 blah, and that enraged. Karl Marx and, and led to Marxism, which has led to socialism, communism, uh, and you name it, um, which has been awful. So uh, unfortunately, I'm not a big fan of Adam Smith anymore. Look, yes, Adam Smith got many things right. Adam Smith got many um, good things there, but uh, a lot of things that have been credited to Adam Smith, he simply copied from Richard Cantillon, uh, and he kind of... It was his work that that um, brought Mr. Marx out, which we know has been pretty bad 
uh, across the world led to um, uh, millions and millions and millions of deaths and poverty and awful for, for, for our world. So uh, I'm definitely not on the Adam Smith bandwagon. I'm all in on the Austrian economic theory. So hopefully you understand a little bit more. Um, love to see your comments uh, below. Please like, subscribe, share to the ch uh, share the channel, and I'll see you again on another episode of Finance Uncut. Thank you.